Oh, we're not no, stalling. We're not stalling. We're just a lot of. There's a lot of. There's a lot of. There's a lot of energy in the room now. <laughs> yeah, now. You know, that's what you wanted, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah we, needed, we needed to turn it up a little bit. <laughs> well, you, you know, you guys got like we're back in the day having fun. You know, a little mess, a little craziness, chaos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fuck, act like you know what you're doing, man. But just do it sober. Well, I guess that's how we'll start the show. A little meth, a little craziness. <laughs> That's how it ended. That's how the show ended the last time. Okay. <laughs> well, that's how our, that's 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 kind of how our show. Up. Yeah. We a teener, a teener, and a body, or yeah. what? <laughs> it was it was worse than that. <laughs> but we don't want to talk in that kind of. Here's the thing: I want to respect for hundred percent that space in that in that. There we can joke about a lot of things, but that space yeah. is. And I'll, and we'll get to why that's important when we talk about ninety three. So you can just say what's what's so big about ninety three. Well. We can say what's so big about 93. This is uh, episode six of the Damage Done podcast. So I'm sitting here with Shane. I got to amp this up, bring a little more energy for you people out there. So that's what we're doing right now. We have an interesting human being on the show today. Shane, you want to introduce him? Yeah, absolutely. It's a dear friend. Um, you know, our buddy, your mutual friend, someone that you know we've gotten guidance from and Talked a lot of shit with, but somebody that I admire as well, uh, Lance, um, but is also, here with us today. Who Lance is, you want to get the camera on him for the people to see. You look at him, he looks like a goddamn doctor. But his story is quite interesting. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he's he's not Doctor Lance, but I mean, he he does he does some doctor incredible. Doctor something, which is the win medical. Yeah, that's what, what I'm saying. Drugs but medical. but Lance, how does it feel when 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 I say it's like? You were once labeled only as a murderer, and you have a story. Like, how does that make you feel when I, I bring mean, that up? Today, I honor that space by how I live my life. I think that you know, if if you don't, then you live in shame and guilt for what you've done, and the only answer to that is to medicate or to run from it. You know, that's the Fair. truth. And I, so that's how I kind of wanted to get this rocking. Is you know, get the audience engaged with you, looking at you, because I would never. <laughs> I would never take a look at you and think that you had a story like that and a past like that. And what is it that you're doing now? Well, I work uh, three day, uh, three to four days a week doing process groups in Malibu um, at a prestigious treatment center. I also own a business called Life Over Addiction, which deals with families and clients dealing with addiction and or life-related issues that they need help like launching their life again. Because a lot of people, just because you get sober doesn't mean you know how to live. And I think the biggest part in our society is, you know, hey, you know, I can anybody can, I can get anybody sober, but can you do the work it takes to change that? Got it. Hey, puppy. So anyways, essentially what I wanted to talk about was obviously everything that got you to that point. But everything from, I guess, 93, you said was a pivotal year in your life. But what led up to 93 and 27 years of incarceration? Well, let's start at 93 then. Let's, okay. I think that because I didn't know. To be honest, I don't think any of us know where we, how we end up where we end up until we really take a critical look. Mm -hmm. And in 93, in about March of 93, I was about nine years in on a life sentence of 15 to life, mm -hmm. getting ready to go to my first parole board hearing where they, I'm a good boy, can I go home? And I did everything right because I looked the part, I can play the part, we're great manipulators. And uh, the vast my, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I'll tell you what you want to hear to get what I want to get. And uh, then when I'm done, I'm moving on to the next person or thing. And I found myself in ADSEG in 1993 as a result of possession of methamphetamines for distribution and being like spun off my ass. So nine years in before your parole board hearing, you're saying that you were in the hole. ADSEG, Ad yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. And uh, you were selling meth in prison? Well, we were all doing everything in prison. My last six years before I got sober in 93, I probably was sober maybe two weeks during that nine year, six years. Jesus What's Christ. it like doing meth in prison as not opposed good. to doing meth out in the streets? It's, I mean, it's, at least it's, in the streets. It's street. really not good. And, and the problem with it was is I hadn't done meth up until that year. I did everything else because, you know, I'd go to the yard and I was the guy that could go, hey, I could go to the northern Mexicans, the southern Mexicans, the Crips, the Bloods, the Asians, the white boys, the yeah. Indians. What do you got? What do you need? I do two or three laps. I come back and I'm selling drugs for everybody and getting a piece on both ends. So I go in with a pocket full of dope and a bag of canteen. And my buddy, my roommate was the plumber, which was the winemaker. And all the plumbing chasers had two liter bottles of wine cooking in them. And he had a little book and he kept tally on who was ready. And that's how his hustle worked. And we had a two, we had a two liter bottle of wine every night with a pile of drugs. And that's how we did our time. That's and it was great until it wasn't. 
and, and what happened was is that somebody came along and they were doing bringing in a lot of coke. A okay. couple of players were bringing in coke. Well, now we're talking. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. It was. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not really. It's kind of crap compared to coke or to meth. But no, I. No, I mean, I'm a connoisseur. I, mean, I know. I am. Like I'm thing. a way bigger fan of coke mixed with heroin. Though. But but the piece of it is hundred percent. I don't know. You saw we were talking about yeah, meth. Like you it's guys that. are. You guys like are like. You guys grill. are the high sedility folks. I guess us <laughs> trailer park folk, right? Yeah. For, but the, yeah. the piece of it was is that I didn't know. I thought it was coke, and I, and he woke me up on a Saturday morning. Oh, so you, and, and that's why you never I, did meth until you got tricked yeah, into doing. I meth. thought it, I didn't. He, I don't think they thought that, and they gave me a. I, I told them to go screw off. It was Saturday morning. He, I used to have all kinds of hustles, and one of them was ironing. I'd iron you shirts iron and all shit? that tight shit up. I had all kinds of hustles. I liked stuff, and yes. took care of my business. And he, he, I got pissed at him, and he took a rock about the size of my thumb, and he threw it up on the locker, and he goes, just break a piece off, dude. I need this shit. I'm going on a visit today. And this was one of the connections, so I'm going to tighten him up. Yeah. But I'm going to do some Cheech and Chong lines. Oh. You know, and I did a couple, L- fat, large lines. a couple fat, thick rails. I lined them up, and, you know, you don't play with it. You just go to the neck with it. Mm-hmm. And as the second one finished going into the other nostril, I kind of realized this isn't code. Because it burns bad and makes and you feel brain, like you're going to fall out. And my brain just goes, ah. Because I'm a meth head. I love that shit. I have ADHD, so it brings me to earth. Yeah, it was and a different. Yeah, it smells like cat food whenever I do it. No, it smells like cleaning beer. agent. But the, pe- the piece of it is, is that for me, we all we talk about alcohol and drugs yeah. and like one is too many and a thousand never enough. And, and I remember the first time I did meth, I knew my life was over. It was that day when I did meth, I knew I'm, I'm screwed because I can't stop. It's really? like I am a, I'm a robot. I become enslaved to it. And within a month, I mean, between tweaking and sitting in my room at night thinking the squad's going to come get me and shit because you can't Yeah, because you get super effing paranoid. Yeah, and so I'm hearing noises <laughs> and I'm looking out the window and shit. And I'm like, this ain't good. And ended up locked up in AdSeg. Yeah. And March of 93, you know, um, just to kind of move past that little scenario, I remember um, it was 93, March 11th, about 1.30 in the morning, and I was crying. You know that time when, in our lives where we find ourselves broken? Yeah, that happened to me a lot, especially the last time before I got sober. I would literally, I would shoot large amounts of cocaine and heroin and then cry to God at night, thinking like, this just, is it. I can't My life passed this. me by, I I can't, but I can't this. get out of it. Yeah, so and that's where I was at. Well, okay. I was on my knees in the ad seg in the cell. Hi? Um, a little bit, but I mean, I think I still had a big chunk to go to the neck with later. Yeah. Got it. But I know I, I think by that time I had gotten sober, I went through a three day. I didn't think you could black out on meth and I lost three days on that right, shit. But you figured I did out you a could. lot. I did. Yeah. yeah. I weighed way, way too much. And it was pretty good. Sure. Meth, lots of so iron. It was bad. Took kick, yeah. It took place. It was all bad. No, I was in a cage and they just throw they throw lunches in at me because my boss was the ad seg program coordinator and they said fuck him he could sit in there until he sobers up which wasn't really a good experience, oh, but yeah. I came out of it in March 11, 93 at one thirty in the morning with tears and snotty nose and just wrecked and ruined and my life was over. I said God I can't live a decent life and continue to do the things I'm doing. Help me, and I think that was probably the purest prayer I've ever said in my life from a deep place in my soul. Uh-huh. And I've been sober from substances since. Wow. It wasn't a white light moment. It was a deep place of mourning and grief for yeah. where my life had ended up, you know, and it hurt. It was painful. Why did you say sober from substances like that? Do you, do you think that you weren't sober, like in a different mindset or you just, that's just the wording that you use? There's mean? a lot of people that have been on the show that are talking about like, yeah, I've been off substances, but I was still addicted to the lifestyle. Well, uh, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. Three months later, I went to the parole board from that March 11th experience and, you know, it was a very uh, difficult three months because I had to think about going in front of three parole board members. And I knew that Matthew's mother, Matthew was the one who I killed in 1984, uh-huh. his mother, Tina Mafia, his wife, and her parents were going to be at the board hearing. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I felt a lot of shame and guilt. And you're sitting with this in isolation for yeah, three months, for right? three months, so which is nothing but you no contact with other me humans. and God and my, my deep, deep thoughts yeah okay. and so the, i have to say that that board hearing was probably the most liberating experience of many that i've had along this journey because when i went into the board we talk about surrender in the program mm-hmm. i knew i had a problem i had surrendered that morning when i said that prayer but 
it was like I was able to tell these board members, I'm a piece of shit. I get it. I'm broken and I have problems. I don't have the solutions, but I can admit I have a problem now and I'm going to do something about it. And they were like, wow, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, they were encouraging because I didn't have anything to hide anymore. Okay. It was kind of liberating not to lie or be dishonest, you know, just honesty was an amazing thing that day. But as that board hearing went on, Miss Ellis got to speak on behalf of the family. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget how she talked about Matthew growing up and bringing puppies and kittens and birds home and that he wasn't necessarily the sharpest kid or the best kid. And he had his own problems, but he didn't deserve to die. Sure. And the whole time she was talking, I'm like, I'm a piece of shit. I should die. You know, our self-talk. Sure. I shouldn't even be in the same room as this lady. And um, she spoke for about 10 minutes. And then she made direct eye contact with me. She looked me in the eyes and she says, we're Christians. We don't believe in hate. It would serve no purpose. We forgive you. She looked directly at you and yeah, said that? Yeah. What was that like? I don't, well, I don't know quite how to accept that because I'm a piece of shit and you should tell me to burn in hell. Yeah. Not forgive me. It and kind of caught you off She guard. followed it up by the most profound statement I've heard anything in my life. She goes, but we don't understand how you could have done this to our loved one or to our family. Hmm. And I couldn't answer that question. And I wasn't going to blame it on meth or drugs. That was a cop out. When you there committed was, the crime, were you on meth and drugs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was definitely an influence, but to blame it on a substance yeah, yeah. would have been disrespecting her after she just forgave me. And even though I didn't understand that then, it felt wrong to blame drugs and alcohol or minimize my actions that night. Hmm. And so she set me on a path to discover why I did what I did, you know, and that I left that hearing with a four year denial, which obvious. But it was refreshing to kind of have a clean slate and move forward from that point with no lies or no bullshit. Because and now you now you can start doing the work. Yeah, you know, I, I and I didn't even know what the work was, well, but sure. you know, I, I was I had like a foundation of like, okay, there's ground zero. Well, you're you you exactly you said that, that you had surrendered, which I think is the first part. But also, it's it's great to see that you're here. Um, just in the fact that that window shrinks and is fleeting, right? I, mean, I know a lot many, of guys. How many times has that happened in our lives where we're so willing to change something and we're so over the, whatever, whatever it is that we're up against, right? We're just defeated. And then maybe a week or a couple weeks or even a few days go by and we're back, back to in. doing the same shit. We've been a few hours. Dude. Well, but right, right. Fucking we can get to, 100%. yeah. When we talk about the lifestyle and addiction, there's, yeah. it's understandable to me now. And I talk to a lot of families about that because they don't understand addiction until I talk with them. Yeah. And it really, I, I know how to clarify that in layman language now where people go, oh, no shit. You know, it's kind of like, it's not rocket science. It's just a matter of somebody being willing to listen and learn. And for us as addicts and alcoholics or gang members or thieves or sex addicts or gambling addicts or whatever your thing is, because it's not just drugs and alcohol, it's behavioral yeah. shit too. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a long process of transformation and change that has to happen. It's not just getting sober and not doing your thing. Right. You know, anybody can stop, but then if you just stop, you're going to continue to start going in yeah. the same direction. I used to think that was how things worked. I used to think you just don't do the drugs and then now you're a great person. Yeah. I, well, you know, I you go to, to a meeting, you light a candle, you say a prayer and, you know, you, you hear somebody speak and a miracle happens and that yeah, shit. Well, I mean, good happen. luck with that. Yeah, yeah. What the hell? 100%. I'm just in prison doing a life sentence. And I went to a whole lot of meetings before I went to prison. Shit. But I'm not blaming the meetings because I've learned a lot now. And I don't judge. I think if it works and it does work for a lot of people, then bless their heart and bless those programs because I sometimes participate in those things because the gift that somebody gave me, I, I need to give to others and be of service and, and, and be that person because that's how I honor my victims and my past. That is my forgiveness. Us sitting here right now doing this work is our forgiveness. Sure. When you help that guy with a hamburger that looks like he's starving on the street, that is your forgiveness. You know, it's not, you know, it's not just like not using, it's about how you live your life is how your forgiveness goes. I hear that, man. No, for real. Like that, that cuts me deep. It's something I always have words to say. I think that's why she's laughing. So, but you know, I mean, like, this is our life, you know, I've, I've lived this journey and the problem with what Miss Ellis set me on a path was a problem was a gift. I believe she gave me a piece of her spirit that day and forgiving me that I lacked from somewhere in my life. I didn't know it then, but I know now that she's always with me and her son and her family and his son, Brandon, and it's an emotional place Sure. because I never forget what I took. And I always honor that. And even though it may be uncomfortable, I don't give a damn. I'm going to face that, that darkness with a shield of light. That's Matthew and his family. Sure. And, um, 
But what happened was, is I left that hearing and I was like, it was like epic. You know what I mean? Like the earth stood still type moment. And I went to another prison like three months later. And uh, I was sober, but I really wasn't doing anything other than staying out of trouble and being sober. You're just not just, doing drugs. Yeah. No more Cheech and Chong lines. No, I I was nothing. You know, I just was living whatever I could get by to not get in trouble because, you know. And I remember I had a roommate who was a square. You know, prison guys aren't always drug addicts or alcoholics. And, yeah. and this, I had this square, opie looking dude, man. It's my roommate. And rarely would I have anybody as a roommate that wasn't a lifer because cleanliness and the pattern and routine is important in there. And this kid, he goes, mm. you should go to those meetings. And I'm like, what the fuck is a normie telling me I got to go to meetings for, dude? That's fucked up. And this is not a lifer. You're saying this it's just some random kid doing short dude. time or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. And he goes, look. I'll go with you. Now, that even made it worse because I got a normie that wants to take me to an AA meeting in prison. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Okay, God, uh, I'm in. And so I started going to an AA meeting once a week. And just like typically most of us do, we talk shit. We don't really do a program, but we know the book. We can memorize the steps. We know all the lingo. We just never fucking get in the car and drive. Yeah. That's the MO for most yeah, people. 100%. And one day I go to this meeting like six months later. And there's a couple of new people in the room. And this one guy comes in, and he's got a cut hair tattoo on his neck and ink on his hands. He's probably about 45, 50, shot out looking dude. You know yeah. what I mean? He wasn't no, no, no. He didn't look nice look and at. clean cut like you. Oh, you know, yeah, like me. <laughs> and uh, and he had like sawdust on his pants from working that day. And he just looked shot out. Mm -hmm. But when it got to him, we had all been doing our normal spiel about what we thought and didn't know shit. And it got to him, and he started talking about childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And about how his sister died around Christmas and he blamed himself because he wasn't there for her. And how his girlfriend was raped and cut up by two guys in an alley here in L.A. And how he took it into his own hands to uh, bring justice to one of them. And went into prison to get the other one and he ended up being a, a major gang member. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into specifics because that's his anonymity. Sure. But, you know, this guy was like talking real shit. And we all could identify with the hurt and pain he was talking about. And he goes, you know, I found these 12 steps and somebody helped me figure it out. I started doing it and figured out it worked and it works just fine. And it was like, it might work for you. And he dropped the fucking mic and it was like, who the fuck are you? Because <laughs> nobody talks like, you know, I've been, I go to a lot of meetings and I don't hear many people talk like this guy talks. And I'm like, you got something. Yeah. So we started watching him and hanging out. And eventually we started having a group of six of us over a bowl of soup at lunch. And then we had like meetings on the yard by the weight pile. And then we started. These are AA meetings or you're doing your own type of um, like process? Our own groups? kind of things. Yeah. Okay. And um, what I didn't know then is that Richard was actually um, developing a 12 step program called Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous. It's called that now. It was originally California Gang Members Anonymous mm. because he saw it as a lifestyle and it, that it was much bigger than just alcohol and drugs. And I was like, that, that kind of resonates with me. I wouldn't go to meetings because I didn't want gang member in my jacket. Sure. You know what I mean? Because I'm a lifer. You don't go to pro board with a chrono with gang member attached to it because that's like stigma shit. And so one day in Richard's wisdom, he goes, well, why don't you just go? You don't need a chrono. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? He kind of yeah. cornered me, right? So, okay, I go to a meeting. I don't need a chrono. But I got to tell you, I went into a meeting and there were nothing but ex-gang members, BGF, skinheads, Aryan Brotherhood, Northern, Southern Mexican, yeah. Crips, Bloods, and they're all crying, talking about real life shit. And I was like, what planet did I land on? You know what I mean? But it was so real, it, it allowed me to be real. Interesting. You know, when you can be honest with somebody, it allows them and it invites them to be honest and, and reciprocate that honesty. That's why our power, our messages and our stories are so powerful to helping other people. They're sure. our number one tool to help other people break out of prison of the soul. And so... I started following Richard and I became a historian in my life, you know, and I found that my journey started without at a young age, like in Northern California in the sixties, my dad left at 13 months old. So it was me and my mom. Yeah. And mom was a hate Ashbury girl who liked to drink and party. So I was home a lot of nights alone with my dog, wondering if mom would ever come home. It was a very lonely, scary existence. I mean, my earliest memories are at home alone at night with my dog. You know, or sleeping in the dog box with the dog because I didn't have any security, you know. Mm -hmm. And by six, you know, I had got kicked out of kindergarten because I didn't know how to socialize with kids. And some kid in kindergarten tried to take one of my blocks and I hit him over the head with it. 
Really? Yeah. Got kicked out of kindergarten. Now it's interesting you're saying this because I did this thing on Instagram where people submit questions like ask you, and one of the like the common thread in a few of them was asking like how how did how did that individual grow up? Yeah. It's like a, That's did you story. grow up around crime? So this is yeah. This and, is paramount, and, in, and it is paramount to yeah. I think at the average person realizing that we don't just wake up one day and shoot meth or kill people. Yeah. It's not a normal thing. Something is broken and wrong for somebody to do that. You know, a majority of the time. Yeah, of look, I, I agree. Look, I, I don't yeah. kill. I don't kill people. Yeah, I yeah. Think. But I don't just. I didn't just wake up one day and just decide Shoot to heroin. take heroin and cocaine. Yeah, like, no. There was there was a reason. Hundred percent. And not to justify it, just no, there was a path. Yeah. But it just it just worked out that yeah. way based on life events. And so by six, I had no self image. I didn't feel like other kids. Mom had me in Winnie the Pooh overalls. Mm, you know what I mean? Corner overalls. That. And when kids picked on me, I picked back. You know what I mean? I didn't care. I had ADHD and I was a little fucking In Winnie the Pooh overalls fighting back? Yeah, yeah, I was a psychopath yeah. little like Zoloft bubble. You know, I Zoloft wasn't happy. Bubble? Where they put you on that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, they wanted to put me on fucking, uh, uh, what do you call this shit? Riddle? Riddle. Riddle. Mom wouldn't Riddle. give me drugs because they were bad. So I dealt with it. And obviously, I spent more time in principal's office or at home than I did in the classroom. And it wasn't that I was stupid. It's just I didn't like sitting in a classroom. I didn't have that focus. And I didn't like being in that environment. Yeah. And so, you know, by six, by six years old, I had, you know, discovered that I was different than other kids and that I didn't have what other kids have. And I didn't go to Little League games and trips with people. I had a father figure that did some stuff with me, but it wasn't like that. Yeah. And at six years old, we used to play pinball at the Greyhound bus station okay. around the corner. And that was the shit when we were kids. We didn't have all these new Well, shit. that was a big deal? Oh, yeah. That was the shit. But I was always mooching quarters off of my friends. Or you give me a free game if you want a free game. But I really was like, it reminded me of what I didn't have. Mm. And one day going home from wherever the hell I was at, I thought it was school, but I don't know. But I, I remember there was a rack of Coke bottles, a couple racks of Coke bottles in somebody's yard. And I knew those were money because I had taken cold bottles to the store for my mother before. Mm. And it's, it's six. You're not thinking about stealing and shit. You're just requisitioning. You know what I mean? And so I take these cold bottles to the store and I get a handful of quarters. I got to tell you, man, that was the best high I think I've ever felt. I got couldn't get to the pinball station quick enough to give y'all motherfuckers quarters and say, huh. I am the shit. Yeah, look, and look I'm look playing 10, 15 games. And I mean... I've never felt that normal. Like those quarters gave me an identity. You felt empowered for empowered. like the first time in yeah, your life at that point in time. It was a high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like any other drug, the minute those quarters were gone, that feeling came back and it was like, uh oh. Okay, mom's purse, the piggy bank, you name it. And it all started out a little small shit, but pretty soon it was like, I'm stealing what ain't nailed down. And I run into somebody like you or you, and you're like, why are you really winning the pool court? Come on, man. Let's go over to Sears. And all of a sudden, I got Levi's and a nice shirt and some fucking Nikes. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I kind of like this. That was free. Mom asked me where I got it. I got it from Mason and fucking Shane. You know what I mean? Their Who's parents that? are cool. They had me down this shit. Oh, okay. Whatever. Because mom's too busy partying. And, and so you started lying then, too. Yo, that. It yeah, became. Yeah. And, and But you can see how this little kid is moving away from that little bastard kid and creating this illusion that makes me feel normal. Sure. And it was thieving up until nine because mom told me drugs and alcohol were bad. She had actually, one time my grandfather, when we visited him in Oxnard, tried to give me a Flintstone vitamin and I ran to my mom with it because it was a pill. Oh, wow. So yeah. You, that's how bad that's how drugs were. It was were. ingrained, yeah. Yeah, okay. And at nine in Northern California, we went to an aunt's and uncle, Aunt Lois and my other uncle and my cousin Scott, and we're sitting in the living room in Petaluma, and my aunt goes under the couch and pulls a trail, and she's rolling a cigarette. She lights it and holds her breath and hands it to my uncle, who passes it to my mom, who passes it to my cousin, who passes it to me. Well, this must be acceptable. <clears throat> you know, coughed and shit. Wow, I fucking got something else I love now. Yeah. I love weed. I didn't know what it was then, but uh, you know, between nine and twelve, I found out what being a pothead was because now I can go to school and I got pot, and you know that's fucking the shit. Yeah, people thought you were cool. As I'm fuck. cool as fuck, and yeah. now oh, it, the persona is growing, and now I got I've been around cocaine and acid and mushrooms and all that happy shit by twelve, and you know it's normal. And I get into my my our shoplifting turned into some burglaries and some other shit. Yeah. I've been to juvenile hall for truancy, so it wasn't scary because guess who I see in juvenile hall? Your my friends. friends. Your friends. You know yeah. what I mean? All your friends. So it's not a deterrent. 
No. You know what's interesting? I just had this uh, revelation. Like, I was an IV addict for a long time, but growing up, I was so afraid of needles. Like, Same. petrified. I remember me and, my, me and my brother used to look out for each other when we'd go to the doctor's office. If that... If that doctor, you know, if he comes out with that thing, you you scream and you let me know. And then, sure enough, Dean comes out. Shane, run! They they brought out the needle and like I'm taking off in the in the doctor's office. My dad's chasing me. He's laughing. My mom's hysterically <laughs> laughing. The nurses are laughing. And here you are a few years later, like who's got a freaking outfit? Yeah, right. You know I mean? But then yeah. it's like those constructs get pushed back. Yeah. The more that you start, you know, kind of drifting away or finding. It was really the lack of the identity that I had that pushed me down that road. Of course, selling drugs, absolutely. And doing, and he's the man because really it was just you he started kind of masked in fear, and I had no identity. Yeah, yeah. your identity was what other people thought of what, you, what, or what you thought they thought of you, and you'd kill for it. Exactly, I know. You start yeah. crossing lines, you think you'll never cross. Never cross to do, and that. you know what you're doing, but you, you I, I want to go. No, because there is a little voice that's like, "This is stupid. This what is, are you doing? You, what you're going to do a home invasion? Like." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> This you, is don't, you don't even need what's in the home. Like, yeah. why are you in the car right now? If you're yeah. like, no, I'm with two other guys. But that's the brain. We've already given into that that lifestyle. Yeah. And, you know, we it's hard to pull back. But see, like, between 12 and 15, now Juno Hall became a regular theme. And, and, you know, being kicked out of school, getting fights at school, you know, you name it. And at 16, I'm in a Juno Hall camp. And, you know, I've tried every kind of drug but basically heroin and meth. Got it. By 16. Yeah. Got it. And, you know, a lot of bad shits. I've had some good experiences that weren't so good. But at 16, I was in a program and the counselor said, I have to take you home to see your mom tonight. I'm like, cool. I get to go home and see mom. You know what I mean? I mean, even though mom was who she was, mom was still mom. Wherever she was at was home. Yeah. Got it. Period. You know what I mean? And it was fucked up, but it was what it was. And I loved her. And I had a little sister by that time who was four years old, Jen, but I was so disconnected and running on my own path because I just couldn't deal with the reality of life mm -hmm. that at 16 going home, this counselor pulls over and he goes, I want you to know that we're going home because your mom wants to tell you she has cancer. Fuck. And I didn't hear cancer. I heard death. And I'm like, fuck you, God. You know what I mean? And fuck everything else. You know what I mean? I, you know, the only thing I love in life you're taking from me. Yeah. Now, of course, that was like internal dialogue, but it was like the, the conscience kind of whatever little conscience I might have had left turned off. And, you know, of course, she told me we cried and I'm an emotional person by nature, which drugs help me deal with. Fuck yeah, same here. And I so, get yeah, I'm a crybaby, man. But yeah, you know too. what I mean? It's like I cried twice today, actually, good. but yeah, I still cry. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, a lot, you yeah. know. And so... The next three years was watching my mom's life deteriorate from mm. cancer. But what happened at 16 was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. Beyond her getting diagnosed with cancer, right about 16, around that time, I had gotten out and I was hitchhiking. And I got picked up with some friends and said, hey, you want to do some meth? I didn't know what meth was. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like cocaine. And I'm like, free dope? Sure. You know what I mean? What junkie doesn't want free drugs, I right? I love that. It's the best kind of dope, actually. And so actually. they picked me up. We go to this apartment. We're in the garage. And they got like an eight ball, maybe a quarter ounce, like a nice chunk. And I'm like looking for the mirror. I don't see a mirror. And they dump it in the ashtray. I'm like, that's strange. And then they put water on it. And I'm like, that's really weird. What the fuck are they doing? Then I see a needle. And I'm like, that's junky shit. Yeah. Whoa. And drug addicts are the most foulest people. Fuck yeah. Because it's like somebody caught that look on my face and was like, Oh, you've never done this? It's all good, homie. And now I got two problems. One, I don't want to be a punk. I can't two, punk out. Right? I want to get high. So, and, and you know that because you're a junkie yep. and you're like, just hold your arm out and look the other that's way. What, that's how I started shooting dope. Yeah. I would and, and turn it the other way. I could never have it. And, and you'll feel a little prick and then let go and you'll be good. Yep. And when I let go, the problem was is that a lot of the people don't understand for somebody with ADHD that struggled with thinking and clarity in life. Mm -hmm. When I let go of my arm, it was like the spaceship Star Trek Enterprise going through space at light speed, yeah. the noise. And then when it comes out of warp speed, it's like in front of a planet, like, voop, and you're in front of a planet. Mm -hmm. When I let go of my arm, that was my experience. It was like, voop. I can hear shit and see shit, yeah. and everything is normal, and I feel fucking balls great. You know what I mean? And wow. Dude, I've never even noticed you had a fucking beard. Wow, that's some gnarly shit. Fuck, yeah. It was like some... <laughs> I, and, and, and it was like I never... I remember the first thing I said was, 
I never not want to feel this way. This is the this is this is like the normal. This is how I should have felt my whole life. And 100%. it was the curse of curses because between 16 and 19, my life as my mom was dying, my life was dying. And I remember it got so bad that my mom was in the hospital on her deathbed around 19 and I had Juno Hall's programs and shit that my parole agent from Youth Authority said, I don't care if you show up at the hospital loaded off your ass. You need to show up and say goodbye to your mother. Mm. And I did. And I remember my mom's last words to me. It was today's her birthday, actually, so it was kind of strange. Happy birthday. Um, she said, you know, I just want you to be a good son and take care of your little sister. And as a junkie and as a thief and a piece of shit, I knew that was impossible. Hear that. Um and, you know, it just pushed me further off to the wild side. And I would say probably within a year, um, I ended up facing a death penalty locked up in county jail for murder and robbery. You know, um, I didn't care. I was, I was in pain. I was, I was hurting. And I didn't care who I hurt or who had pain because of me. You know what I mean? It was like I was so disconnected. I was basically walking dead. And um, I remember, you know, like not even caring. I remember the night, I mean, I stabbed Matthew. I'm not going to get into details because it's not important or the people because I kind of let them off the hook to go live their lives. Sure. Because there's no sense in four people doing a life sentence when I'm responsible for what happened that night. And that was the facts. And they all got free. But... You know, um, I remember sitting there and he was saying, help me. And I knew I was powerless and that he was going to die. And I knew that I was, my life was over. And that was in May of 84. So you had like instant remorse as you were committing that crime when you were saying, help me. And there's nothing you could do about it. I don't know if remorse was in my vocabulary at the time. I knew that the abyss that I had been playing around just swallowed me up. That was the end. That was the that was the end of my life as I knew it at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, the chaos of my life up to the point that we've discussed. Yeah. That was like that was like the first life. And a whole other path was like I had no idea, but I knew technically my life was systemically over at that point. I was it was gonna be different. And four days later I was in the county jail facing a death penalty. So they caught you that fast. Yeah. Well, Somebody told somebody, and then somebody told somebody, and then next thing you know, they're like SWAT teaming me and shit, which is just you know. So it's just a robbery that went wrong. Was it? Was it? Pre I don't even know. It wasn't. Pre we were gonna roll a drunk to get some money to get some meth. You know what I mean? It wasn't a big. And, and and I actually remember sitting in the living room and saying, you know, in my remember we talked about the thinking. Yeah, sure. Lance, just go fucking home and take a cup of volume and go to sleep. This is stupid shit. Really. And my friend, well, associate, I was going to yeah. say friend, but you can't. Well, you thought he was your friend. Yeah, one time. of them, the, the, one of the guys there that night, I don't want to mention names and put anybody sure. in a space, but he kind of like, he, you know, I'm in that space of maybe I should just go home. This is stupid. This dude doesn't have anything. And um, this other individual that was sitting across the room from me, because the Vic Matthew was sitting like close to me in a chair. He goes, Oh, you guys were all hanging out with Yeah, him. in his house. Got it. It, it wasn't was some random dude. No. Well, no, we don't even. Do, it was a random dude. Okay, we were going to get some meth and party, and he's like, come hang out at my house. You know? Got it. Okay. I mean, it wasn't the smartest thing. I'm not holding it on him, but sure, yeah, sure. you don't invite strangers to your house to do meth. But. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just. I'm not going to say I haven't done that. I don't that, know. Tweakers are weird, though. Yeah, yeah, it's not the weirdest thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, but you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would never invite people over Common randomly. Common sense is like, wait a minute here. Right. And so, you know, Kevin, the guy, he goes, one of my associates, so he, he went like this, like from across the room. Like, and to me, it was like, like we're going to do this. Like, are we going to do this? And I'm like, fuck, I just want to go home and take some volume, but I got to do something. You know what I mean? And so I figured I'd intimidate Matthew. I had a knife. I usually don't carry a knife. I'm not a that kind of a violent person. I mean, I'll fight and do stupid shit, but I've never stabbed anybody. Yeah. And so I was going to scare him. I was going to lunge at him and scare him, right? You know what I mean? And freak him out, like, give me your shit type thing. And uh, he coiled back. But when he coiled back, he coiled back in such a way as that the way I went to stab, it, 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 it went in and cut his spinal cord off and severed his spinal cord and he got paralyzed instantly. Mm. And I guess I had jabbed twice and I hit him in the front of the neck too. 
And he slumped out of the chair and fell on the ground and was saying, help me. And I, I knew I was fucked. You know, my life was over and I couldn't help him. And, uh, yeah, it was a fucked up scene. And I, I can go minute details, but I won't, of that night. But four days later, I got arrested, and deservedly. And I didn't know, a, I want to say I didn't know a robbery was going to take place because that wasn't my mindset. Yeah. My mindset was I didn't want to be a punk. That's all you yeah. cared about is what these people were about to That's think of you. So you that, hopped up trying to wield this knife, trying to punk someone because you thought you and had I to stabbed, like... Yeah, and it, it ended up killing him. Yeah. And uh, ended up in county jail in four days facing a death penalty. You know, and that was a 16-month ordeal of like... A so lot you of hit things. arraignment? What did they tell you? Like, did, you probably didn't know immediately you were facing well, death penalty. Well, yeah, I pretty... Well, well, I mean, you hit arraignment and you know you're doing a death sentence. That's know what, what they mean? told They're you. They're trying to kill yeah, you, yeah. you know? And I was pretty much, uh, I've already had my conscience turned off and I knew they were trying to kill me. So I was very dark and ended up having like, I want to say 67 jail cell changes and about 115, 120 write-ups while I was in the county jail. Because I was starting riots. I was attempting escapes. I actually escaped once out of the county jail. How did that go? Uh, it was fun. I jumped off a six-story building and didn't break anything. You know, now, how is that possible? Wait, wait, wait you're in downtown LA? No. CJ? North, oh, okay. North. I was like thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing CJ hey, in my head. Yeah. And then then people ask me to this day, the, the police and the parole board, why did you escape? And I'm like, okay, we're all in the room like this, and there's a hole in the roof, and you're all facing the death penalty. Who's staying? Huh. Yeah, you got nothing. And they you got like, yeah, I'm bouncing too, dude. Into that, that, that. You know what I mean? But that was like, come on, what you, you're trying to kill me. I'm going to do everything I can. You know what I mean? Of course. And um, eventually I made it to prison. Um, 20 at Vacaville and uh, they said you're not going to go to Folsom because you're too young and vulnerable and fucked up. I have a question. Did you go to trial or did you accept a deal? I Well, it ended up the guy, one of the people that night turned state's witness and he was trying to say that the red and white paid me to kill this. He just made up stories. It was just, who tried to pay you? Yeah. Nobody. Just some, yeah, some, okay. yeah, I'm Got not going to throw them under the bus because sure, but... I've never been affiliated with that group of people. So I was like, I don't even know where that came from. Okay, got it. But, got it. you know, he was trying to save his ass. Like it was even like a murder for hire situation? Yeah, I've already cut them all loose and they're going to go home. And this guy's like turning a state's witness. And I remember this individual, I'm not going to say his name. Yeah. But he was, the day before I was going into trial, he was in the, the other cage. And we're all on the stairwell and he's in the cage. And I'm yeah. like, why are you over there, man? And he goes, oh, nothing. I'm, and I go, I pulled him up and I says, you know, if, if my name comes out of your mouth today, yeah, you're going to be the last thing. I, I'm going to be the last thing you see in life. Sure. And I meant it at that point in time because I was like, how can you dare? I'm already facing a death penalty, dude. I'm taking this beef off you and you're going to go in there and throw me under the bus for some bullshit? Yeah. But in that, my mentality was dark and lifestyle at the time and I didn't have a conscience, so I didn't care. And if I had a chance, I probably would have did something to him in that cage. Of course you would have. Because, dude, what are you doing? You know what I mean? I'm your boy. I'm going to take this beef off of you, and you're trying to get me on the death row shit. Yeah. You know? I didn't, I didn't calculate. But needless to say, he did what he did. He got up in there and said what he said. They paid death penalty. And I escaped out of the county jail, and I'm sitting in Ad Seg after my escape. And I got to – How long were you – did you escape eight, for? eight, ten hours. We got to another city. It was a whole – there's a whole there's no about eight, oh. eight ten hours. No, you said we. Like well, there was four of us. Okay, yeah, but yeah. I'm not gonna. That's a whole podcast in and of itself. Great, we'll have you on for episode two with that one. <laughs> but yeah, yes, it was a great story yeah, too. Yeah. I, I, it's a great experience. It was like top of the world shit. You know what I mean? No, I get it. Look, man, like I've done a lot of the drugs you've done, that haven't committed the crimes, but fucking escaping jail with three other people. Oh, it was a thrill. Like it was insane. a thrill, especially when you face the death penalty and you're like, yeah, this is the best. Yeah. Ever. But, you know, it was it was an experience and pissed them off real good. Of course it did. But huh. I ended up, I thought I was going to jail for the, or courtroom for the escape, and I got in the courtroom. And, I, and it's a death penalty case. You have the best attorneys and best private investigators they can give you for free. For free, really? Yeah, because, I mean, they got to defend you to the best of their ability. They can't say, oh, we just threw some garbage at him. You know what I mean? Because then you can get off on a They want to make sure you got a good attorney because if they get you, they got you. Yeah, okay. And so... I go into the courtroom right after the escape, and I'm thinking it's about the escape and stuff. And um, I get in there, and my attorney at Elliot, he's like, just shut up and listen. Don't say a damn thing. Because I respected him. I knew he cared. Even though I was a knucklehead, he cared. I, I respected him. And uh, the judge goes, so I have a motion for dismissal before me today on the case of Lance Wright versus the state of California or Sonoma County or whatever it was. And I'm like, oh. 
And uh, he goes, do you have anything to say, district attorney? And the district attorney goes, and it was this tall, lurchy district attorney. I, I hated him. He used to wear a carnation flower hmm. in his shit. And I, I prayed one day I could get close enough so I could eat that fucking flower and just fuck with him. <laughs> I hated that dude, man. He was a piece of shit. You know what I mean? He really was, like, in, in my mind at the time, like, you were Satan. You know Satan. what I mean? What are you doing? You know, I want to make you, I want, I want you to remember me, you know, type thing. And uh, needless to say, what happened is the individual who turned state's witness had given a statement to the youth authority parole agent at the same time, but it was a different story. No shit. So they had two alternating stories on the state's witness, and they had to throw the case out because their witness was shown to be fucking full of shit. And they, they, the, the judge looked over at the DA and said, so you'll be filing on a lesser charge tonight, I assume. And the DA was like, yeah. And so... So you were at first degree with the death penalty. They and threw that out. And it was just open, and they came back with a first degree straight up. They, were, they said... I was with no death penalty. With no death penalty. And no. about two months later... So did you get released in that no, time? No, 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 no. They weren't letting me sit nowhere near those streets. Because I'd have been gone. Yeah, yeah. Or at least tried to. But um, about two months later, my attorney comes up. We're getting ready to go to jury and all that stuff. And he goes, they're offering a second degree, which is 15 years to life. Mm -hmm. But they want to tack on a year for the knife and a year and four months for the escape because they want that to be part of your record. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't care. But I go, that's a lot of time, man. Look, can I think about that overnight? And he goes, I go, what kind of time would I do on a, on a 15 or 17 for to life? You know, that's a lot of time. And he goes, you'll do about 12. At the time, that's what they believed in 84. And I'm like, cool, I'm down. And uh, so I ended up taking the plea deal. And For blah, second blah, degree. Blah. Yeah. And they shipped me off to prison thinking I'll do 12 years. They fought me all the way to the, I got out through the first appellate court after having four dates taken by the governor. Three dates taken by Schwarzenegger. What do you mean? So, so you had release dates and Schwarzenegger took them away? Three of them. Wow. And I got out, I got a, a 3 0. I won a, a writ in my county of commitment, ordering a, overturning the governor's decision to take my date. And then they appealed it to the first appellate court, the AG. And then they, uh, uh, in a 3 0 decision, the first appellate court ordered my immediate release, saying that the governor had violated my rights. And I wasn't the same man I was when I was 20. And it was. You know, let him go. That was your second appeal right there, or your second date that you're talking about? That was an appeal on the second date, yeah. Got it. That they took. And how many years in were you at that point in time? 27. Oh, so you were, okay. Got 26, it. 27. Because I didn't even know anything about it. And a buddy of mine, I came back from the parole board after my second date, or after my second date got taken. He goes, give me a copy of your transcripts. And then he gave me a writ of habeas corpus, and I submitted it, and I won. And then they appealed it, and then I won that, and then I came home. July 28th of 2011. What goes into a writ of habeas corpus? I don't ask me. I'm not you don't know? You just felt, you just I just followed questions? my buddies. You know, we, the, you got to trust me. Lifers were tenacious about law and knew their shit. That wasn't my specialty. I was a recovery guy. They were the legal guys. How did it feel to get out? <laughs> Surreal. I mean, you know, you really, I mean, I was already free spiritually many, many years before that. But I recovery. imagine the world had changed too. Oh, yeah, I mean, I remember being on a on a Greyhound bus. I, I remember they take you to Stockton and drop you off at the bus stop, and you're sitting with some cop, and uh, until the bus shows up. And there's these little kids. You know how in Stockton they got the little runners trying to get information and sling drugs. At the, and I know what the game is. I'm watching these little kids trying to get information on dudes and who they are. And I kept blowing off this little kid. You know, I kept up trying to get information. Like go away, go away. And then I see him report to his old G sitting out by the bus spot. You know what I mean? And then they come back and try some different tactic and go back. And, you know, he just, I guess, gave up on me. And as I was walking by him to get on the bus, he was like, so what's up with your story, old OG? And I go, just 27, man. I'm going home. And he goes, man, welcome home. You know what I mean? Shit. You know, and uh, I got on the bus and I remember there was a gal in front of me. She's probably 25, really gorgeous young lady. And uh, she starts talking to me on this bus trip. This is the I'm first like, time I've probably talked to a woman, a woman in ages. Is 27 years, legitimately free woman. Are you freaking and out? I'm like, no, I'm oh, just having a conversation. I've, I've not, I, I learned to have a conversation through recovery and what I've done in recovery. Got it. And so, you know, she's talking about going to a wedding in uh, San Diego and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. And she goes, so what are you doing going to LA? And I'm, like, I'm going to go work in addiction in a treatment center. You know what I mean? I don't <laughs> know what else to say, you know? 
And I was going to a friend who owned a treatment center who gave me, you know, you guys know Beit Shuva, you know, Rabbi Mark gave me a place to land, him and Harriet. Love Rabbi you know, Mark and Harriet. You know, you know, yeah, they they kind of gave me a place to come home, you know, and they gave me a foundation. So you got released and went straight to Beit Shuva. Yeah. And they, it wasn't like I was in treatment, but it was like I was in transition. And that's how I was treated there. I had a job in 30 days and I'd still go to groups and do my thing, but I was kind of a different bird. How, how did the work that you did inside we never really talked about that yeah. but the work that you did inside obviously you know you still doing doing that and improving on it and it's an everyday thing but how did that translate when you got to Bay Shuva and got out well you know the person that richard who's my mentor i call him more he was more than a sponsor he was like an elder mentor mm -hmm. um he told me to put away my big book and my pamphlets and my brochures. And he says, you can't give something away you don't have. I don't want you to be a parent of me, Bill, or Bob. I want you to have your own story so you have a message to carry. And you do have a message. You just have to learn it. Mm -hmm. And that was the journey, learning how my childhood got where I got to 19, why I did what I did, which we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. And to really understand that kid and have some compassion and love and empathy for him. You know what I mean? That he never had. I had to be the big brother to that kid. He never had and say it's safe to live free. Sure. You know, and then there was a day I remember we, we created that pro. Well, I, I was part of the creation, I guess, uh, one of the founding members of Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous. But that program taught me a lot about life and myself and, and how to look. The 12 steps are not quite the same as I hear them. I mean, I learned them at a deeper personal level. And I don't need to talk about the 12 steps to take somebody through it a lot. Matter of fact, a lot of my private clients don't even know they're doing the 12 steps half the time. Interesting. Because they're tied into everything we do. They're not really complicated. Well, it's really, it's, it's like pr they're principle based. Yeah. I mean, there's a problem. There's a solution. You have a choice. You fuck people over. You did good. You have resentments. You've shared it with people. You've got character problems. They show up in your behavior. If you figure that out, you know what you did to people. You can begin to begin preparing to make amends and make shit right if you can or if you can't. Live better. Check yourself every day. Have some kind of a relationship with something bigger than you and then help the next dude. There's well, I mean, I, I speak that lingo and live by it, but yeah. what, what would be, look, you've done a lot of work on yourself and you're very, very wise and eloquent. Like what would be, what would be some a practical way in layman's terms to tell whoever it is out there that might be struggling or going through? I mean, look, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. There's people that are in fear of finances, got laid off from work. Um, don't really have trust in uh, what's going on in the state of California on, you know, Multiple maybe, it may, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. what, what would be kind of your, you're not alone. People understand you. You know what I mean? You just got to give it a chance. You know, don't be afraid. You're not alone. Really. You know, people understand you. There are other addicts and people that have pain just like you. And, and they can, and if it takes them holding your hand till you can walk on your own, that's what we're here for. You know, if there's any, for any problem you have, there's a solution if you're willing to ask and look and, and do a little work. You know, and it doesn't have to be something as major as um, no, meth addiction. Maybe not even, yeah. Like I, I mean, I, like we talked know, about this briefly on the yeah. phone, like it's it, the, the, again, like the human condition, the human condition, issues, yeah. correct? I mean, I deal with people, a lot of people with mental health stuff, Yeah. you know, and I apply the same principles with them, you know what I mean? And I just let them know somebody cares. That's all they want to know. And they want to trust somebody because a lot of times mental health people don't have trust. They're judged, they're ridiculed, just much like addicts or alcoholics, and they just want somebody to care about them and understand they have ups and downs and just treat them like human beings sure. and teach them the life skills they need. You know, like I learned to be in the lifestyle, how to be dishonest, a liar, a thief and all the other negative stuff. Absolutely. Well, now I have to learn how to be honest and responsible and have integrity and character and you know, all the other things. And if I live those things and practice them every day for a year, guess what I become? I become a better, more effective human. And that's, that's the truth of it. But you, you, you can't get there without putting in a little effort. You know, there's, you know, cause I, don't work on the same level that you work in, in addiction treatment, but like a lot of people right now try to use the excuse that the pandemic makes it hard to actually like work on yourself, change, well, be so better. So not having a dad and my mom being a drug addict and so there's that and for all sure. that other shit. I can make excuses. Exactly. All I, but I, I see it completely different. I think this is like the most wonderful time and opportunity to take a good look at yourself, whether you're again, well, they are looking drugs. at themselves. That's why they're sitting in their house isolated right now lit. Yeah, that's exactly. I think it's a they, they have nothing but to look at themselves. They can't hide in work or Disneyland or any other. 
other shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They got to they got to deal with themselves, or they're home with their wife and kids, who they haven't been home with their wife and kids, or wife is home with their husband and kids. And it's like, wait a minute, whoa, what's this? And you know, I need a drink to deal with this, and then that drink turns into a bottle, and then they're in treatment. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've Shopping, almost yeah. I've almost done more things in in this pandemic than I did because if when I wasn't in the pandemic, it's work and stress and this, and then meeting with guys and trying to help and worrying about family, but it's almost like when this happened, everything got put on pause. I started to learn how to play tennis, got back into the gym, been reading more. And it's started like, a podcast. It yeah, must, we started it, a it, podcast. It, like these, it must these be things. nice. It must be nice, man. Can I hire you guys to do my job? I want to go play tennis and golf. You yeah. know what I mean? No, but I've these, these, thi- th- yeah. these things will continue to be a part of my life moving forward because I also realize like there's enough time for everything that matters. Yeah. You just have to make That's a time. huge thing to say, though. Enough time for everything that matters. Well, the common really, excuse is I don't have time for this Well, shit. because how aimlessly, like, scrolling on Instagram or this or that, and it's like you start looking at your phone because you know, Apple's technology is out of this yeah. world. It's but fantastic. it tells you your screen time. Yeah. And when I start looking at it, and I'm like, eight hours? I don't, I don't even want to say how long. Yeah. Eight it's, hours. It's embarrassing. Eight hours. But it's you know, like in that amount of time, though. Like Some of the most amazing things I've seen in this pandemic – as frustrating as it may seem, is families walking together, going out together in packs, walking and hiking or taking long walks as families. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a humanness that's come back in this. I just wish that hopefully when this pandemic lifts that we remember that we're human and we can do the same things and not be divided by party or politics or race or any of that shit. And we can take what we've learned in this experience and come together as a better people. I well, that's I wholeheartedly. I, agree. I mean, that's I, a whole. Yeah, you know, I, I hope, mean, because I, I think there's something that's happening that we don't really see that goes beyond the toxic stuff that we experience every day. If you turn your TV on, if you look Facebook, yeah, you're fed else. with toxic stuff. You think the but, world's ending, everyone's bad. But I think when you're home and you're with your family and you get to see the beautiful, like taking my niece to San Diego with my wife a couple weekends ago and just having a, some Mexican food in old town San Diego and people enjoying their lives and everybody getting along. And it was like, Oh, it's like uh, breath of fresh air. Yeah. You know, I don't even like what my wife will tell you news and all that shit. Leave it alone. I don't want to hear it. I don't care. Although I kind of like seeing certain individuals get a little dogged out, but that's you just like the troll. Like, I get it. They're kind of like, yeah, I like trolling a little bit. You know yeah. what I mean? Because people are just like these socially engineered lemmings that just follow anything. And I can't go. Heard that. that. Shit. Heard that. They just have some critical thinking skills and, and like look at the facts. And I get you don't like individuals or you don't like individuals, either party, whatever way. But look at the critical issues and what they represent. And you might have a different perspective. Sure. It's a very uh, revolutionary thought to have these days, especially well, in Los wish, Angeles. Yeah, I know. You just, you know, I mean, <laughs> but I'm a moderate Democrat. You can't even be that anymore because if you're not liberal, you're a Trump. You know well, what yeah, I mean? And I'm you're like, racist. You know, yeah. And I, I know that's not the truth because I called a friend who's with the NAACP that I did 20 years ago, did 20 years with, mm-hmm. who's up in Sacramento. And Mike is a dear friend. And I was like, Mike, I'm not, I don't feel ashamed of being white, but I feel sad because I'm being judged for being white and I've never mm. been racist. And I get what they're talking about with systemic racism. It's not an individual thing. It's a cultural thing, but it seems like the spotlight has turned from the cultural thing to an individual thing. And that's sure. not right. Right. You know, I think we need to address it as a community and I think we all can in a healthy way. And he talked about some of the things he's working with some of the people in the BLM and stuff. And I was really appreciative of how he was approaching it, teaching them to be proactive socially, politically, community wise and other things, and to give them a purpose and a voice that's healthy and brings people together rather than burning things down. hundred percent. Well, cause you can't, we as whatever, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or, a moderate Democrat, like he called it. Whatever it may be, nothing can be solved un- until there's an honest conversation. And I have to understand where you're coming from, or at least try to. I can try to help have you understand where I'm coming from. But even if you don't agree with me, hopefully, the hope is is that you can leave a little bit more informed about what I think, you know, and how maybe I grew up or my views, and then how we can move forward and agree to disagree, but in a positive way. Yeah. Instead of my mind snapping shut and 
you know, cursing you out and being resentful. You're a liberal or you're a deplorable or you're whatever. Yeah. Right. yeah just but the labeling just, thing. It's just not, it's not useful. It's childish. Yeah. It's just but not I think that thing. serves a purpose for something that I'm not going to go down the path for because there's powers greater than us at operation that I'm going to leave alone. Fair. You know what I mean? Because that's like, I want to keep this to like people that, you know, I don't need the news and that to live a healthy, wholesome life. And no, help and again, and that's I, the space I like to live in. Yeah, because yeah. my spirituality becomes tainted when I get caught up in the toxicity that's our our thing world. that's happening to a lot of people right now. And so, for me, stepping back and becoming spiritual and focusing on helping people and growing my business to help people that has meaning to me, and it and it's it's spiritual and it's in connection with my higher power and me. It makes me feel like I'm honoring my life and the things I represent. And, you know, I, I have my viewpoints and I've shared it and people have been offended and they're right. They have a right to be offended as I've been offended by some people's viewpoints. Sure. I still love them, even though I've been unfriended by a few. But that's cool. You know, that's <laughs> their right. You know, what I mean, it's Facebook. I mean, it's not. Eh. And uh, the people that know my heart know my heart. You know what I mean? And I can be opinionated. I'll judge myself much harsher than I'll judge somebody. Absolutely. Else. That's one of the most important things for me to learn. And I, know, I mean, I judge it with integrity and not with humiliation or degradation or shame. Sure, no, no. But to build I myself up and to help other people. I mean, I love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah. And I could be wrong. Hey, imagine that shit. Somebody could be it's wrong. hard to say you that. You know huh? what I mean? But for, for this journey, I think the biggest piece is, is helping people move from a place of problem to solution. Keeping it simple. Giving them foundation that they can change. You have to be the light in the darkness. And that's what we are. Sure. And if we can't be that, then we're not serving our, honoring our own recovery and our own path. Is that a way, and, and thinking that way, is that, was, was that a tool that, that you developed in order to like start, uh, fully own that second life that you said you lived and not live with like guilt, shame? A lot was, of people carry guilt and yeah. shame. Obviously, there's well, something very... Shame is a cop-out and... It really is the addiction. Okay. I don't buy shame. I think shame is some shit that we play with so we can justify How fucking so? up. Well, look, think about guilt. Guilt. There's nothing wrong with guilt. We all have guilt. Yeah. What I do with guilt defines me. Okay. If I'm if I'm in shame because of my guilt, that creates anxiety, insecurity, low self esteem. You name it. We can self pity, self loathing. That. Yeah. We can just make a book on that. Yeah. And we've all lived that to justify the way we lived. Or to say I'm just a piece of shit, so right. So that's carrying shame. Like I'm a that's piece of shame. shit that's going around. Well, I'm shame. a piece of shit. Yeah, this is what I do. I'm a victim. A poor me fucking okay. victim. I'm sorry, but that's shame. Maybe I'm not clinical enough, but that's how I don't feel be about clinical. It. But that's on great. the guilt side of it, that's that's a one side of guilt. Okay, I can go there, or I can go. You know, Mason, what I did was inappropriate. I see it. I know it was wrong in my character. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that never happens again. Even if you don't want me around, but I value your friendship. And because of the things I did, I know you may not want to be part of my life. Yeah. But I'm not going to forget what I did. And I'm not going to do that to another human being. And I'm going to remember you and honor you and how I live my life. That's accountability. And I can live with that guilt. So you're saying there's no can, accountability that comes with shame. There's no accountability in shame. Got it. There's poor me and victim shit. That's an excuse. And people just fall into that pit. And they, oh, whatever. Fuck that. Let's be accountable and responsible and you'll feel better about your life. It may not be the same and you still might feel like shitty in certain situations, but at least you can honor it and know who you are mm. and stand up in integrity for a change. Or you can wallow in shame and self-pity. Yeah, that's a really shitty place to be. It wallowing is. in shame and self-pity. Most of us struggle there, but you don't have to live there. Correct. You don't have to live there. Yeah, I didn't know there was a different way to live because yeah. literally, not that I had like a bad life. I had a different upbringing than you had, but like I still found myself wallowing in shame, self-pity, insecurity, and like it's fucked up. And then it culminating in what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, which is shooting large amounts of drugs and then crying to God that I can't get out of this. Yeah. And there's tons of people going Just through like this exact moment. And dying. Dying. They won't get the chance to talk like this, have this relationship. Like, I, There's a stat that I saw a couple years ago, and I, I'll never forget it. Half of the people that died in the United States uh -huh. under the age of 50, 50 oh, let me rephrase that, 50% of the people that died under the age of 50 in the United States died from opioid-related causes. When? Recently? A couple years ago. No shit. And it's gotten worse. That's crazy shit. That's a statistic that just made me go. And yet we're talking about. And it's hardly talked yeah. about either. No, they well, because it's like those people. 
Because well, it's a, it's a stigma. they're stigmatized. Yeah. They're loser junkies. And, and they don't understand that it could be their kid or their aunt or their uncle or their cousin or father or daughter. They don't know. And drugs don't discriminate. No, it doesn't matter. And, and, and it's like, as long as I say your problem is your problem and it won't affect me until it affects me, you know, they didn't do anything about the drugs and the cocaine they were pump the government was pumping into South Central until it got into Beverly Hills. And then Absolutely. all of a sudden it was a problem. But, you know, I mean, the government, it's the government. Thank you, Ronnie, that didn't remember anything in Oliver <laughs> North and the Iran-Contra thing, which was a real fucking thing, Freeway Willie. You know, I mean, it, it was fine as long as you're blowing up this 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 racial community, but don't let it get to, you know, the Palisades or Brentwood or Hollywood. The thing is, it gets there. Problem. But it gets there. I know. And that's what America doesn't understand is that um, opiates are creeping into every walk in every community, rich and poor, and tearing them yeah, apart. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm the example of that. So is Shane 100%. Like, I grew up in Calabasas. Yeah. Recently lived in the Hidden Hills. Neighbors like Drake, the Kardashians. Yeah. And you're over shooting and, fucking And I'm right down the block coke and buying heroin. crack on Skid Row. Fucking tight, right? Yeah. But it doesn't it, discriminate is the point. No, it doesn't. I mean, I'm working with a guy right now that's kind of an elite individual. Sure. I won't put his stuff, but I mean, guy did piles of cocaine and five hundred dollar night call girls like it was candy for a long time, and you know what? It was like, eh. and you would never know. Yeah. But it was like, so I've learned not that it, the drugs and alcohol and lifestyle stuff doesn't discriminate, but what happens is is that families don't want to talk about it. No, they don't. It's it's the dirty little secret that's not a dirty little secret when you're sitting at the wake for your loved one. Yeah. You know, and until we start to really put that out there and say, we need to have a, 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 a national conversation about how to bring light to this and stop pharmaceutical companies and, and, and government entities that come on. I think what was that movie that the it was out of South Central about drugs? And one of the guys said they're not bringing it across the border on mules and donkeys anymore. You know what I mean? They're bringing the shit in on like shipping containers, shipping containers and stuff airplanes now. they were at one and, point and, in time. And you can't tell me that. That shit's just being allowed, not allowed to poof. You know what I mean? The yeah. amount of drugs that's used in America every day isn't just. Well, like we're the number one consumer amount. of that, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. correct? Well, and I know that it's our government's. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, a whole different After story. South but Central, yeah, Central, we know. But the thing is, back to stigmatization, yeah. and then what you're talking about, making it a national conversation. It's usually, like I said, people are labeled like Until that's a junkie, or they see what a junkie looks like. Unless you look at my arms, you wouldn't know I was a junkie, or you knew me. You know I look I mean? like a doctor. You look like a fucking doctor, you know? Yeah. And it, so people don't see the other end of that or what value people in our – I'm not trying to talk us up, but like people yeah. in situations that we've been in well, can uh, have some value to other people. They think like that's it. It's limited once yeah. you're a junkie or once you're this or once you're there's that. There's a stigma also in, I'll say, normies that don't have our problem yeah. that you don't talk about problems. You don't show the problems. Mm. Right, because problems are weak. And it's easier for me to go, you're a junkie and not look at myself. Fair. And, 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 and I'm not judging. I'm just saying, you know, our no, human no, no, no. nature is what it is. It's much easier to get out of the headlights and minimize and justify and rationalize that you're more fucked up than me, so I must be good. Well, that used to be one of my <laughs> favorite things to do was fucking point shit out on other people because, yeah. I'm first of all, I'm vicious and manipulative, and it makes me feel so much better. Like you just said, because I'm not looking at myself. I can just point out all these terrible things about you. Yeah. I'm cool, man. I got to deal with my shit. But, you know, coming like coming home, I think that I realized – and this is the bigger piece of recovery. I think it was back in 2000-ish. A couple things happened. One, I remember sitting in the back of the chapel. I had about seven years clean. It was a Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. I was sober seven years. I was really doing a program good. Changed a lot of my character and stuff. And I remember going, what am I doing? You know, I was sober and everything was good. And I was helping people and things were really good. But I had like, what am I doing? You know, I didn't have a purpose or a vision for my life. You know, I thought that mm. I had to have this roadmap of how things were supposed to be because that's what, you know, it should be. Like there's a, a, a book written for you and you follow the script. And I didn't know what was around the next corner. And that was like, eh. And this little voice inside that day said, continue to do the things I set before you and I'll show you ever greater things. It was like my creator, I believe, saying, son, quit worrying about the details. Just do what I put in front of you and it'll open up more for you. Mm. Yeah, just do the next right thing. Yeah, it's amazing. And I, I still remember the echoes. And now I'm sitting here with you working at a prestigious treatment center, sponsoring a billionaire, you know, yeah. fucking working my own private company, flying around the country, around the world, doing recovery work and stuff. And I'm like, 
Wow. Things you never would have thought were possible. No, I would have thought you were on some crack or some shit if you'd have told me this back in 2000. That we'd yeah. be sitting here today doing this. Yeah. And, and, and what's possible is that we can become some of the most dynamic, caring, empathetic, caring, beautiful people because we have the experience and we know the pain that people have that they don't want to talk about. Yeah. And so that's the gift that I get to do for a living is let people share their authentic self. Well, discover their authentic self. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, and then, you, and then yeah. go out and share that with the world. Yeah. And that's, you know, I used to think for me, like my story, there's a lot. It's, you know, it's, it's like the, the stigma around it. And like, I don't want everybody to know and this, but the truth is, is I'm so grateful for all of those experiences because they shaped me into the man that I am today. Absolutely. And the brother and the son. You have self-respect and integrity because of the thing. God you're willing, doing. the husband one day, yeah. you know. Um, well, Mason's but, available at her. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm grateful because you saw me in one of my weakest places in him. What, by the way, what did you think of us when, when you first <laughs> met us? You know, here's the deal. Yeah, let's anytime hear the deal. I'm, anytime I'm in front of somebody, I don't differentiate. No, don't, come on. We were really special don't. though, man. But yeah, Shane and I think we're quite special, man. I know you can. Everybody thinks we're special. No, for sure. But it's it's one of those things where I, I I'm not really. Somebody dealt with me and helped me find my life when I was fucked up. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm with, seeing somebody sitting in front of me that wants to change, I know what's possible for them, and that's what it's about. Because I know how important it is and how good I feel about life, even on the bad days that I want you to have that same experience. And so that's what you get when I'm working with you is you get all of that experience and you get somebody that really authentically cares about you. Yeah, I knew that from the get-go. You know, yeah, and, and I could sense that. Too. I mean, I've uh, again, I read people really well. There's people that I didn't get along with there. There's people that yeah, I did yeah. it's because I, you know, but I always knew that you were authentic and real. And it's all you got. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, that's what why I'm, I'm, I do good work. I mean, somebody... Because, it, because you speak the language of the heart. Yeah, somebody the other day goes... So how many people have you helped get sober? I go, I don't know. You know, how many people have you worked with that are still sober? And I go, hmm. a lot more than my fingers and toes. Sure. You know, I don't count them though because I don't, that's not my business. That's God's business. I just carry a message. You know, I'm a channel of God's love and, and, his, and his compassion through my experiences to help you get yours. Sure. hundred percent. No, you helped me. Look, even I, when I met you, you were my counselor when I was mm -hmm. going through treatment and things didn't work out for me, but I never would be in the place that I'm at right now, if I didn't have that experience, because as I, I guess I felt, I would call it falling from the high horse, because I was on quite a high horse, you know, I was doing well relatively to how poorly I was doing, I'll always say, but I, as, in those moments, like I was telling you, when I'm like praying, crying, like, God help me out of this, I'm thinking back to like, wow, like the life I was starting to craft during the time mm -hmm. that we were working together. And it's a journey. Yeah, that's exactly the point people, I was going to come to. Like it's this, a journey. Yeah, the stages of change are really cool. because yeah. I And I like the fact that, you know, the sixth stage is relapse. They didn't stigmatize it. They made it part of the process. I mean, everybody relapsed. I relapse all the time. You just never see it because I correct it in my head. Mm -hmm. I have fucked up thoughts. I have fucked up ideas. I have all that 100%. shit. I just don't act on them because I know it's inappropriate. And if right. I change a thought, I change an action. I change everything. You know, but I, I mean, and I don't know, it's a mental relapse, but it doesn't have to be a physical manifestation. Yeah. You know, I just say no. I had to learn how to say no to myself. That's difficult. That's a, that's, yeah. Especially <laughs> after you're saying yes, there's like meth, coke, heroin, don't care. this, that, like, steel. The brain, the brain is very interesting. I've learned a lot about the brain that... You know, the amygdala and the little baby inside the brain that cares about sex, procreation, and uh, pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, it usurps power over the executive function of the cerebral cortex and begins to define the journey for us. And I know that's the case because we've all had those nights or those days where something says, Shane, you really shouldn't go out tonight with Mason. It's, it's going to just get fucked up. Don't go. And you say... Fuck that. Mason's got good dope. I'm in. And mm -hmm. then Mason ODs and dies. And you're like, fuck, I knew I should have listened. I shouldn't have went out. It's like something, your cerebral cortex is giving you a big old stop sign. And you're like, fuck you. It's because at some point, there's a tipping point where the cerebral cortex is usurped by the pleasure center and the amygdala. Mm -hmm. And you don't have control. You're doing things you normally would never do. Mm -hmm. Fair. Increasing consequences. This explains why we can't stop. Once we take a substance... 
it grabs us and owns us. And whether the substance is a drug or that experience of uh, people seeing that uh, facade of yourself you're painting, yeah. Yeah. whether it's buying new things yeah. all and the time. what happens is it takes three weeks to 30 days to get homeostasis or bring that back into balance so that we can start to think clearly again. That's why I think they say 30 days in treatment is optimum. Yeah. So you at least pull your head out of your butt and go, okay, what the hell just happened? I mean, you're more experienced you know, yeah. than I am in this field. I think oh, I'm really longer. Smart. I think, I'm I think longer well, than 30 I mean, days for yeah, sure. But I mean, the 30 yeah. days yeah, is yeah, just yeah. to kind of like thaw So you can out. land. The so you can out. land yeah. for sure. That's where I like to step in three, you know, between 90. Because the person is not 90. even close to being sane. They, well, they can, you can get people sober, but it's a transformation part of yeah, helping yeah. them change their lives that I step into because that's the part I enjoy. And I'll know real quick if you're full of shit or not. You know what I mean? That's just the truth of it. You know yeah, you what I mean? And I'm not going to fight you with if that. you still want to go, just like in the book, go. You should tell me, look at me with that look a lot. Be like, man, you're so full of shit. Yeah. What the I mean, fuck do you mean I, I'm I, full I'm of shit? Lie. I didn't even know I was full of shit. But you're but, telling me I'm full of shit. It's crazy. You, you know why? Yeah. Because I'm you. Fuck. And I'm Shane. Yeah. And I know you. I know the little kid in you. I know the addict in you. I, that was me. I know that dude so well. I know him as good as you, if not better. For sure better than me. And, and it's like, I, I got you. You want to do something about it? You can say stuff. It's your shit. No, you would say that as you're drinking coffee. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Shit? I didn't Christ. care. I mean, yeah. my job <laughs> no, was to No, you cared, but you truth. didn't care. You're like, I, 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 care, care I don't care you about your truth. bullshit. Like, yeah, exactly. That's and for so the birds. That's when I'm yeah. working with people. That's where it's at. And, and you know, it, it seems to work when people realize, damn, I can change. And the thing about it is, is that we create these neural pathways. Everything we do is neural pathways. Your mm -hmm. brain is a big com supercomputer of neural pathways. One and one is two, two and two is four. Meth gets me, makes me really freaking happy and blows out a hamburger when I'm hungry. So I Fuck, want more. Yeah. And so, and I didn't get in trouble. So I'm going to do more and I didn't get in trouble. So I'm going to do more. And at some point the amygdala says, wow, I like this. And it, in that flips and you get to a point where more is not enough and you can't stop it's never enough and then you're like i can't stop and you're controlled by that amygdala and that that primal energy that yeah. even though you know what you're doing is wrong you can't stop yeah. until you're you're it's arrested through like treatment jail jail you know, being death. surrendered last or time death, yeah, yeah. you've got to come to a place where you can surrender the last two times i i went through this shit was literally being the the whole process i went into the arrest part to get to surrender by being arrested like mm -hmm. it has to be like <laughs> that extreme have to go to jail for a few months i don't time. regret 27 years in prison that's a big thing to say i think that in many ways it saved my life i think at 20 the condition of my life was such, and I had so many felonies yeah. on my jacket by that time that something bigger than me, call it God or creator or whatever in the universe, said, son, there's, there's a couple choices here. Mm -hmm. One, I can leave you out there on the streets and you're going to end up catching a third strike case at some point. You're going to have like 90 strikes and never come home. Or, you know, you're going to do some bad shit. I know what's coming because I'm omnipotent and I'm God. Mm -hmm. And I haven't allowed that to happen. Because it's the only thing that's going to wake you up and transform your life so that I can use you to save other people. And that's what happened. And that's what happened. And, and I needed, and it's like not a happy place to do 27 years. But I've, I've, I don't regret it because I met wonderful people and I was taught by a man how to grow up and be a human being. And you would never be living the life you live. And I'll always honor Rich and the people that I've worked with. And we're, there's hundreds of us around the world and in California and all over the place that honor the people we've hurt by the lives we live and help others. And there's hundreds of us across the country that have got come home as a result of what we do. And both of you are part of that journey now. You know what I mean? Whether you like it or not. And you honor it or you don't. It's your choice. That's between you and God. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up in the morning. Is it about you or is it about the guy next to you? It's a difficult thing. That's why I would It's not difficult. It's no, 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 no. For, for me, it's not no. difficult. But no. I know there's... A, there was a long time in my life where it was difficult. And I, I speak to a lot of yeah. people on the daily where that is difficult. Yeah. Because they're still in that place. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to you say. You have to that. be the light in the darkness. 100%. I would have never gotten sober had Rich never opened his mouth and told me it was possible. Because mm -hmm. I thought all the 12 steps and all this shit was a bunch of fucking bullshit. So did I until, until yeah. I saw Shane yeah. come visit me at Habad. Yeah. And I'm like, 
How the fuck are you still sober, dude? Yeah, well, you, you know, you, you go in, you light a candle, you say a prayer, you read a book, and yeah. some, uh, drink a cup of coffee, and some miracle happens. Well, that shit never happened but for that, me. And that's such a big misconception. It that's is. That's what a yeah. million people think. And, and then they relapse, like and it's the program's fault. You have, you well, have no everyone... idea what you're even talking about. Exactly. You, miss, you miss the whole thing. But... <laughs> yeah, no, yeah sure. I know. I, but you no. get it now. Yeah, of I thought as soon as I was that person. Me too. Yeah, I know. Exactly. We all were at some point on the journey until I met Rich. Invade Shuba with a fucking two liter of GHB, you know, <laughs> was on GHB. Yeah, and I, I would always think I was pissed at like quote unquote recovery because I thought now that I'm not doing drugs, everyone's supposed to forgive me. Yeah, all these things I want to have are supposed to happen. No work on my timeline. Oh, poor, poor Mason. And Mason yeah. was pissed. Yeah. Yeah. What the yeah. fuck, dude? dude? You trashed my house and now you want me to This guy was going around me. speaking to the youth, fucking dropping yeah. in, yeah. looking like Shout Rico out. Suave, like you know what I mean? I was I doing was. my thing, we kinda <laughs> lost track for a little bit and yeah. and then reality set. That's what tripped me up because like I was quote unquote doing well at Bay Shuba, Shane struggling, and then all of a sudden I go out there, get worse, start shooting drugs, end up in jail again, and I see this fucker walk through and he's just all happy, this, yeah. that, whatever. I'm like, what? You've been sober this whole time. I've been fucking up. And then he ended up taking me through the steps. And now yeah. we're sitting here. Yeah. And, and, and it short. works. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's a great journey. What's Fuck amazing yeah. about it, too, well, for me, is that other people saw it tra- happening or transforming before I did. Because obviously, we're the worst critics, right? But yeah. Yeah. it's like, even my even my mom, like, one year sober, two years sober, three years sober. When When's it going to, like, unravel, right? Yeah. Finally, at like four years sober, she, she got it. <laughs> solid, you're, you're back. yeah. Guys, is my son. He's back. He's yeah. Solid. Yeah. You know. I remember asking Rich, you know, because it was like, for lack of a better word, in that world, and what he did, and what he said, and how he lived, was like somebody like walking on water. You know, literally, like fucking. He his shit was like beyond anything you can think of. Like he lived this shit, and it was like, I remember asking, when does it happen? And he goes, I don't know. I'm like, what the fuck? You're supposed to You're know. You're supposed to know. Like, you graduate from high school. Boom, you get your diploma. It happens, right? right and he yeah. goes, no. I just, he says, I trusted another man to follow his direction. I did certain things. I followed certain suggestions. I kept doing it. And one day I realized the shit was working and it was kind of cool. So I kept doing it. Shit. I'm like, fuck. You know I mean? it's, like a, it's like the lamest realist <laughs> answer, right? Like, we want some, but, some scientific yeah, uh, like if you go to the gym, if you it, go right? to the gym, you see weights, you exercise. In a month or two, guess what? You're going to be in shape and look good. Yeah, it's, fuck yeah. You know, but you know, you expect to like, you know, you got to work at it. It ain't just going to fall from the sky. And you know, we as addicts, there's a big drop off when we talk moving from instant gratification. To delayed gratitude. Yeah, that I didn't understand that for so long. I know we want the shit now, and I mean, like, I like to make shit like three months, six months out. So I like, oh, I'm gonna have fun in Bali or with my yeah. wife, or you know what I mean, or I'm gonna like Hawaii or Sedona or like you know, because now you know, I mean, me sitting in the morning in my boxes with my cup of coffee at four a.m. with the dog and just chilling, looking at shit on the phone is my time. You know That's what I mean? Nice. Like, yeah. That's my space. You know what I mean? And then yeah. I go put her out to work forever, driving through halfway out to Malibu from Long Beach. And then I do my thing. Yeah. And, and and it's just being authentic. And I get to live this life. And it's not really complicated. And I get to make a decent living doing it. But it really, the money's secondary to seeing lives grow. Well, I think that's a pretty great place to end. Amen. Talking about going to Bali, living a good life. Yeah. It's Anything not bad. I'm going to home. I'm married. I got a, the business. It's like some crazy shit. Right? Going from uh, what's the name of your business again? Yeah. Life over addiction. Life over addiction. Yeah. yeah. So going from crying in ad seg, spun out on meth to living a amazing life, and helping other people find their lives. And it's possible for anybody. If I can do it, you can't tell me. You I can. can do, yeah. All three of us truth. sitting here. Yeah. I mean, insane. that's just like yeah. You, you don't tell me you can't. You, you, because yeah. that's some shit that you read in a book. You know, you 100%. just you're lazy and you want to still use drugs. So go get high and tell yeah, you're I ready. Yeah, I, 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 mean? I hope you don't die. I really pray you don't die in gaining more experience at being a junkie or a dope fiend or a thief or whatever. And there's hope if you're ready to make that change. Agreed. Thanks, for everyone, for tuning in. Amen. Episode 6 is good. Out,